please welcome a man I'm privileged to say is my friend, Mr. Mark Halpern. Scared the hell out of me coming from the wrong side. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, it's tough being the final act on a wonderful day, especially when we've heard some fantastic speakers. They say if you take one idea from somebody, it's called plagiarism. But if you take many ideas from many people, they call that research. I'm a researcher. And I think everybody in this room also is, because everything I'm going to talk to you about today, really, I don't think anything's too unique. It really came from amazing people before me, mentors, great artists of our business, Ben Feldman, John Savage, Van Mueller, Joe Dickstein. I want to share with you some ideas that I think will be very helpful for you and your clients, and uh, hopefully it'll be very beneficial for all of us. It's interesting that I noted that a lot of the advisors came from family businesses of insurance people. Perhaps the father was insurance or an uncle. My start in this business also was from my father. Although I was licensed in 1991, I really got my start in 1974 because that's when my father, of blessed memory, died of a massive heart attack. He was 50 years of age. I was 11. I was the youngest of four boys. And my mother, who was 48 years old at that time, had to go back to work to support our family. There was no life insurance. There was no will. There was no savings. It was very, very challenging for us. So I come to this profession with a lot of passion, and I'm sure you do too, but I think that passion also comes once we have our first claim as well. And I want to take you through some of that. The world has changed a lot in the last 10 years. We had Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, Bob Hope. Now, no jobs, no cash, and no hope. But it's not all gloom and doom. As a matter of fact, I'll explain to you what I do to engage my clients in this emotional sales process. I share the following with every one of my prospects and clients and centers of influence. I suggest you do the same thing to see what huge opportunity there is for us now going forward. The first thing is governments are not going to be capable of taking care of the elderly in this country. That is not a political statement. It's a math problem. The baby boomers, any baby boomers here? I see some gray hair. They started turning 65 in the year 2011. You're going to have a lot of old people in the industrial world. It's going to start looking like Century Village. And it's going to affect things we take for granted. Real estate, people are going to be downsizing. Stock markets, people are going to start wanting to take money out of the market. But the biggest area is health care. It's probably the largest unfunded debt in the history of the industrial world. To complicate this, with medical advancements, we're living longer. They say 50% of babies born today will live to 104. So there's a real potential that we're going to be long on life and short on money with a false expectation of a big wealth transfer from our parents, the greatest saving generation of all time, to us, the greatest spending generation of all time. But they're going to need it for taxes and health care. And the other big change is we've moved from an industrial age to an information age, or I call it a misinformation age. Our prospects and clients need wisdom and knowledge. That's what we bring to the table. I share that with everybody, and it gets them emotionally involved in the process. There's also been another change, the death of the salesman. Uh, we had some people earlier on, Richard uh, Cooper was talking about the broad concept. You know, we have to focus on being problem solvers before being product pushers. And the only way to do that is to engage them in a discussion and dialogue. We can't be giving a prescription before a diagnos diagnosis. That's called malpractice. So I recommend if there's one idea that you come away from this meeting with, it's the following. Go to the MDRT website, buy a book called The Broad Concept. People mention it many times today. It's by Harold Zlotnick. And that will tell you an information or interview style for every possible situation. And you will get people asking you to buy insurance. I also have a habit of asking my successful clients Tell me one book that inspired you or changed your life, and here's another one that I recommend you get. It's by a fellow named Frank Betker. 
Frank Betker, it's called How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. And whenever I've had people read that book, they thank me profusely. And never assume anything. I used to think you'd knock on the door of somebody very successful and say, what am I gonna tell this guy? He's probably got the best insurance person, best lawyer, the best accountant. And guess what? It's not true. And I'll show you an example of that later on in my presentation, just to drive that point home. And I engage the first question I have with any client is, do you have a will? You know, they say that only 40% of the population have wills today. And of those 40% in the high net worth market, 80% are not up to date. And if they do have a will, don't stop there. Ask, when was it done? Was it done by a specialist or a generalist? Are you a Canadian citizen? Are you an American citizen? Do you have more than one will or do you have a secondary will as well? Get them thinking. They likely don't have what they need and it's your job to explain that to them. And if they don't have wills, they certainly don't have powers of attorney, which is even more important. I had a case just a couple of years ago where two sisters were living out of the country. The mother had had a stroke years before. The father was looking after the mother and suddenly the father had a stroke. And these two girls came back and came to me and said, what are we gonna do? The banks won't let them touch anything. Everything is completely frozen and I had to send them to an estate individual to get them to go ahead and get involved in order to be the trustees for that estate. Make sure your clients have powers of attorney. And then I ask, do you have an estate directory? And of course they say, what's that? And I turn to the husband, I say, husband, you know, if, if your wife died, would you know where all of her stuff is? Her bank accounts and you know, her passports and all. And he'd say likely a yes, because he'd maybe looking after it himself. And you say to him, but, but if something happened to you, would your wife know where everything is? Well, and then, but you know what, you travel a lot together. If there was a common disaster, would somebody know where all your stuff is? And you've never seen, it's 99% of the time you will get that deer in the headlight look. Have I sold anything yet? No, we have a writable PDF available to everybody here at our website, and it's a state directory where you write down who's the lawyer, who's the accountant, where's the key to the safety deposit box, digital passwords. Tell your clients to get this stuff done and put it somewhere where somebody knows where it is if, God forbid, tragedy should strike. Let's cut to the chase. I go through an emotional sales process, but I explain, you know, you probably have three questions on your mind. Because I've been doing this for 23 years, every business owner, or high net worth individual, every family member has three questions. And you know what they are? The first question that they want to have answered is, when will I be in a position where I don't have to work anymore if I don't want to? It's the first question. Second question they have is, if something happens to me, I die prematurely or get sick, is my family okay? And the third question they ask is, if I'm no longer around, do I leave a mess for my family? And you know what? People nod and they go, yeah, you know what? That's what it's all about. Notice the first question is a retirement question. The second question is a risk management question. And the third question is an estate planning question. So make sure that your clients know that you're on the same page with them and ask them that question. And after we get to the will and we say, look, at the first paragraph of your will and structure executors to pay all all outstanding legal fees, accounting fees, et cetera, and debts, whatever, then what's left for your family? And leave it open. And the first person who's gonna answer loses. Wait for them to answer. And I explained that there are only three kinds of people who buy life insurance, only three. First person buys it because they love somebody. They wanna make sure that there's food on the table, roof over their head, money for an education. That's probably 85% of the population. Second kind of person who buys life insurance buys it because they hate the government. And they know the government's gonna be saying, here, give me 23 to 50% of your assets. So they buy two cent dollars today to pay the 100 cent dollars that are gonna be due at the end of the day. And the third kind of person who buys life insurance buys it because they don't really like paying taxes while they're alive. They like to accumulate their wealth on a tax-free basis, access it on a tax-free basis, and pass it along on a tax-free basis. Sir, which one are you? and they'll tell you what they're interested in, even though you know pretty much, but still you're engaging them in the process. The sale before the sale. Does anybody here have any files in their office where they did a lot of work and nothing ever happened? Yeah, 
Like, is your pile like CN Tower size? Mine was, and I didn't understand it. And you know what? I finally put my foot down about eight years ago when I went to see a president of a company that I did a whole bunch of planning for for six months, and I was going to pick up a check from him for $31,000 of premium. Not a bad day, right? I go to see him, feeling proud as a peacock, and he told me that he's decided instead to buy a boat. And he thanked me very much for all of the work we did together. And I thanked him afterwards when I told him that I changed my system around in my business. I started to charge fees for planning in my business because I really believe every one of us provides a service and an expertise that we should be getting paid for, okay? The accountants do, the lawyers do, we should be getting paid for that. But I introduced that. And after I've gone through this emotional sales process, I always say the same thing. Listen, you know what? Bob, you've done really great for yourself. But as you can see, we've identified some financial housekeeping that you have to take care of. And here's the sale before the sale. If I was putting together the agenda for our next meeting, what would you have on that agenda? And I take out a piece of paper and I've got my pen. What would be on that agenda? And he starts telling you all the things that he wants to buy. Oh, we get the insurance we need to, yeah, yeah. And what else, Bob? Uh, will, yeah, yeah. Is that all? What else? And he gives you a long list. Now you're on the same page. And then I set the deadline and I say, Bob, look it. There are two conditions for you to become a client of mine. You have to feel a little brave to do this, right? Two conditions. The one, first one is, is people make an RSP contribution on March the 1st because there's a deadline. They pay their taxes on April 30th because there's a deadline. If we don't put a deadline together on this, I can't have you as a client because you're not going to be helping yourself and I'm not going to be able to help you. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Do you have any idea of that deadline? Yeah, I'd like to have it done by the fall. Okay, that's good. And the last thing is, is look, there's a lot of planning to do and I love to do this, you should know. But, you know, I don't want to be the guy to dig the hole for someone else to put the pool in, if you know what I mean. So you have to feel comfortable that I'm going to be able to help you. Do you feel that way? Yes, I do. Why? Because they've never gone through this experience before because they've been dealing with salespeople. And we're not salespeople, we're problem solvers. Use that approach and you will close a lot more cases. There are three, I do a lot of work in the area of charitable plan giving or exchanging tax dollars for charity dollars and I think we should all be doing that. But here's something that's a really important part of my presentation which is that there's going to be three possible beneficiaries to your state. There's going to be your family, there's going to be the government, and there's going to be charity. And you can only pick two. Which two would you pick? Everybody says they're family and charity. Well, you know, with some planning, we can take the tax dollars that we're going to have to be paid and we can create those into charitable dollars where now your children and your grandchildren can develop some legacy and values and distribute that money in perpetuity for you for the rest of your existence and beyond. Would that make sense to you? How many people here know the names of their grandparents? Yeah, how many people here know the names of their great-grandparents? Much fewer. This is a picture of my great-grandparents in 1931 in Poland before they were killed in the Holocaust. Imagine if on January the 1st, you got some mail and you opened it up and inside was a check for $10,000 from your great-grandfather. You think you'd remember their name? We can create that with our products. And I've had situations where business owners, gray hair, working hard, started to cry because they realized they'd been so busy focusing on the making money in their business that they hadn't done something yet to make the world a better place. We have to engage our clients in that. And I'll tell you about something that happened to me recently so that all of you can walk out of here and make another $100,000 this year easily. I met a man, 72, he was divorced for 30 years and he had accumulated a riff of, of $2.8 million. $2.8 million. He didn't realize that when he dies, half of it is going to the government. That's, you know, like close to $1.4 million, right? Most people don't know that. You should know, most Canadians don't know that. We have to tell them. And when he heard that, he said, what? I said, well, look at he's very charitable. I said, look at he's got other income. From that $2.8 million, he's making over $100,000 a year of taxable income, correct, that he doesn't need. 
So I said, look it, why don't we meet up with a foundation that I'm affiliated with, and instead, let's take that $100,000 a year, which is taxable, we'll give 50 to a charitable foundation that you'll set up, right? So that'll be a tax neutral event. And we'll take another 50 and we'll buy a life insurance policy for a million dollars that you can now give to the charity now so it's a tax neutral event or have it owned through that cash flow and eventually there'll be a million dollars to offset some taxes down the road. Does that make sense? How many rich people are taking out more than the minimum from their RIF? How many? Most of them are taking out the minimum, no more. There's a whole pot of money there, and all it is is exchanging tax dollars and making it into charitable dollars. We can do that. Not everybody is capable of working in the high net worth market or living benefits or group or whatnot, but I think that without a lot of very heavy lifting, you should be able to monetize what you're not doing. I've been a big proponent that finding people to refer business to specialists and getting 50% of something is way better than getting 100% of nothing. And I work with some great people and I have advisors who work with me as well who bring me in on cases. And you know what? It's a lovely thing to see somebody learn and then be able to do it themselves. I highly recommend find people to work with that can help you to be a full-fledged planner. Bonus. We got a couple of bonuses. I guess that's the benefit of being one of the last speakers. Last year, my money business dropped by 50%. I think the markets are at 50%. You know why? Because I only sold one RSP to me and not my wife this year. <laughs> I used to be in the money business. I had about $40 million under management, and guess what? I hated that business. Know your client, don't know your client, don't know the advisor, don't know the money manager. Top down, bottom up, volume, blue chip. It was buy and hold, buy and hold, buy and hold. So I got out of that business and I tell you, it's the best thing I ever did. And I now work with people who do money as experts and that's really serving me well. And you have to become an expert. We've heard other people talk about getting designations. I have a CFP, a TEP. You got to get your CFP if you're going to be serious in this business. It really, it's not so much for the clients that are going to benefit from it, but it's really for you because it means you're invested in the business. You're going to be here. You're not going anywhere. And the last thing is thin edge of the wedge. You have to become a specialist in something. It can't be that you're a generalist and you know it's very nice, but I, I was always told by my mentors you have to become a, a specialist, and we specialize in critical illness insurance. And for those who don't know, we started on the radio back in March of 2005, and we advertised very heavily, and we were getting between 30 to 70 people contacting us a day for insurance. Not bad. And what were we looking for? We were looking for 50-year-old plus business owners paying lots of taxes, with lots of assets, lots of income, and who hate life insurance. I don't want to meet somebody who likes life insurance. I want them to hate life insurance because likely they've seen what it is, but nobody's ever explained to them what it does. And I went to see somebody early on in that first month, and this is why this whole idea of never assume anything, we just have a couple more minutes. And I went to see a, uh, somebody who called and was qualified to spend $1,500 a month for some critical illness insurance. So my brother had made all the arrangements, and I went out to a part of town that I would never go to. It was like, this is not a part of town that I felt safe in. And I was in the parking lot going into this apartment building, and I called my brother. I said, Phil, you know, I'm really nervous going into this rundown apartment building. I said, you know, I never take off my yarmulke, but this is one time I'm feeling very nervous. And he says, you know, if this guy doesn't want to do business with you because you're a religious Jewish person, we don't want him as a client. I said, that's easy for you to say. You're at home watching Oprah Winfrey, and I'm risking my life. <laughs> anyway, I go into the building. And sure enough, somebody lets me in and just trust the process, trust the process. I go into this other room to meet this property manager. Before I did, the office on the left, I see an older gentleman, an older gentleman in a messy office. And I go to meet the other person who brought us in and he explained, I brought you in because I've been buying and selling properties for that other gentleman in the other office and we really need someone to look at our estate planning. And he brings him in. It's like, you know, with the patches on the pocket, multiple pencils, you know, pencil protect. And I start talking, the first question I ask him is, do you have a will? No will, wife a US citizen, kids all over the place. I said, listen, do me a favor, send me a list of all your assets, what you paid for them, 
what they're worth today. And I'm going to bring in some of my experts and we're going to start you off on some, some estate planning. Anyway, they're not even teched up. I get a fax with that full scat paper, you remember, right? And I take a look at it and I grab my calculator. The guy's worth over a hundred million dollars without a will. A US citizen wife. That's what's happening out there. That's not unusual. You should know. That's what's going on. A lot of people, they have no planning done. They're so busy making money that they don't take care of themselves. That turned it into an amazing case where the premiums were close to a million dollars. I'm now the executor on the spousal trust for that family because they made me their sort of consigliore. And I really feel I love that family and I want to look after them. So it's something you have to don't assume. Last things. There's a fellow named John Kluge. John Kluge was the chairman of a company called Metro Media. He died just last year at the age of 94. He was, he was a billionaire, multi-billionaire. You probably don't know about him. If you haven't, please Google him. And he was asked, what was the greatest accomplishment of his life? Listen to the story he said. He had read about an 11-year-old boy in the UK who was dying of, of an inoperable brain tumor. And this boy had taken it upon himself that he wanted to break the Guinness Book of World Records for receiving the most amount of get well cards. So it made all the news and all the media. And sure enough, John Kluge had read this. He sent a card to the family wishing him well, but also said, I happen to be a very wealthy man, and I know an oncologist in Pennsylvania. I'd like to send the boy there for a second opinion. And the family agreed to it. And the boy went to Pennsylvania, and the father, the, the doctor did all the diagnostic work. And he came out and he said, uh, it's true. If we operate on this boy, likely he's not going to get off the table. And John Kluge turned to the doctor and he said, doctor, if this was your son, your only boy, and this is the only option, would you do the surgery? And the doctor thought about it for a few minutes and says, yes, he would. And the family agreed to have the surgery done. And the boy was operated on. And guess what happened? The boy lived. If he died, this would have been a terrible story. <laughs> you would have kicked my behind all the way back to Thornhill Woods. He lived! He lived, and you know what? For the rest of his life, that boy says, thank God I met a guy like John Kluge who saved my life. And John Kluge, a multi-billionaire, said the greatest accomplishment of his life was saving that boy. Not everybody is fortunate to have a John Kluge in their life. But we who are in the greatest industry, in probably the greatest time in the last hundred years as far as opportunity, we have an ability with the stroke of a pen, of some ink on some paper, at a first month's premium to provide money for people when they need it most. Problem is, we're too embarrassed, too shy. We sell insurance, we should be proud of it. And when I attended a funeral last year for a client of mine, a dentist who died in his 60s prematurely. There were 800 people at the funeral. And I saw his lawyer that we worked with, and I saw his accountant, and I saw his banker, and I saw all of his friends. And you know what? I knew I was the only guy who wasn't going to be sending flowers and coming for a visit and giving a bottle of wine and making a charitable contribution. I knew I was going to be showing up with a check, a seven-figure check, to protect that family. You know what that means? It means I'm way more important than the banker and the lawyer and the accountant, and that's the same goes for everybody in this room. <laughs> Last thing, I have a blog, markhalpernblog.com. Please register. We send out all these wonderful things for all of you in this business. I really, you think, why do I talk to advisors? Because I'm grateful for this wonderful industry that we're in. It's provided for me and my family. It's provided for my clients, and my job and my feeling is that I really want to help us all raise the bar in this industry. We have a great business. Please register at markhelpernblog.com, and if you'd like, I write for a publication called The Tax Letter. It's a monthly publication. If you'd like, send me an email. I'll send you off all the articles we've, we've done, which all are creative insurance ideas that you could be using with your clients today to help them and to help yourself as well. So I want to finish by thanking Lawrence Geller, Amazing Lawrence and Serge and Jim, and really for putting this together. It's been far too long. We should have had this a long time ago. It was, we had a bit of a break, but I just want to wish everybody a good evening. Drive carefully. God bless you all, and thank you for listening. <laughs>